This is the Hofstra Radio Alumni Audio Yearbook, Volume 2, and today is January 20th, 2024. Please tell us your name and the years you were at Hofstra Radio. Hey, Brian, uh, this is Frank Dunn, and I worked at Hofstra Radio from 1967 till 1978. Okay. Thank you so much for coming back and speaking with me. It was about almost a year ago, I think just over a year ago, that we had our first conversation, and uh, I'm really honored that you would come back and share some more stories with us. Well, I'm I'm honored that you thought it was worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sincerely believe that every person who's worked – at the station in one capacity or another has a story or hopefully many stories to tell and it's it's all worth hearing. So uh, I'm, I'm excited uh, to talk to you about your time at Hofstra Radio. And as you said, you weren't there as an undergraduate. You had studied at St. John's and, and joined Hofstra Radio WVHC about the time that there was the, the fundraiser uh, when they thought the university was going to close the station down. And then you stuck around a while which is amazing and phenomenal, so much longer than, than most students do. And the question I usually start off with is what titles or positions did you have at the station and why did you go for those? But, but clearly you didn't have any positions. You were a board operation uh, operator or station engineer. I, I guess to turn the question around a little bit, um, what made you stay for so long? What made you stay with Hofstra Radio all those years? Well, it was interest in in radio since I was probably a little kid and uh you know I got to I got to I got to stay they let me stay nobody ever questioned um why I was there although some of the some of the students at at different times <clears throat> resented that this grown-up person who was like eight years older than they were was working there but you know it was fun it was always fun I always learned more you know I became you know, a remote engineer, Teddy Ronneberger, taught me to do remotes. And, uh, you know, that that became a lot more fun, too. You know, just just the excitement. Hmm. Um, so I guess if um, if you were a student at the radio station, if you had spent four years at Hofstra or, or, you know, a little bit more of your undergrad time, would you have wanted to go for a position? I We, we talked a little bit about whether or not you wanted to do on air work and, and how that worked out or didn't work out. Um, would you have liked to have pursued a position at the station? Yeah, if I had been a student there, I'm sure I would have gotten, you know, more, more involved and probably would have had the flexibility to, uh, to try out and get an announcer slot and, mm. uh, and get a show. Whereas, you know, I didn't have, didn't really have that opportunity because tryouts were like at four o'clock in the afternoon before the station went on the air. And by the time I got around, around to that, uh, I already had a career a nine to five job, mm -hmm. nine to five plus job. So, uh, I really didn't get to do that, but I, I definitely would have gotten more involved. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess what I was kind of getting at is that you, you talked in our last conversation about how much you loved radio and how much you loved the environment at Hofstra, uh, working at the little theater, under the little theater, and, and working with all these folks. And I, I guess, um, you know, I'm just I'm trying to get at the heart of the idea that here you have a, a regular, you know, nine to five job, like you said, you've got a career, you've already graduated, um, and something keeps pulling you back. And, and is it... I guess, is it the love of radio? Is it the love of the station? Is it uh, multiple factors? What keeps bringing you back? Yeah, the love of radio and maybe deep down inside, uh, you know, I had hopes of being, uh, you know, the next Dan Ingram or something and somehow that was going to happen. Uh, but that wasn't the way it was going to happen. I just got to hang out and do slots and uh, and be involved. And that, that kept me involved with people who, who were there at the time that had gone on to uh, work in New York City in different capacities and get, mm. and get go to visit them and see how the real guys did it. Mm. That must have been fun to, to uh, the last time we talked, we talked about your expectations of what a radio station would be. And I think you had gone over to visit WGBB and then you were at Hofstra. So when you get to see these professional radio stations, were they, were they, technical marvels or were they just sort of uh, a newer version of what you were seeing at Hofstra? Well, it was a, a newer version of, uh, of what we, what we had at Hofstra. I mean, the equipment definitely was, uh, you know, had a bigger budget. 
but the goal was the same thing to do it right. That's mm -hmm. the thing that I always loved about working in radio. It was live. It was exciting. And the goal was to do it right and not screw up and no dead air. And, mm -hmm. and certainly at WABC that there was definitely no dead air. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's always a, a, a great feeling when, when you, you make a good segue or, you know, you, you stop the station from having dead air or whatever it is, the setup, it's that, it's that immediate gratification. Uh, some people who do theater or live music talk about that immediate feedback, but when you're the board operator or the announcer or putting it on the air, there is that, there is that instant satisfaction. That's, uh, it's hard to describe it unless you've done it, I think, to understand it, you know. Um, when you think about your time, all those years working uh, at WVHC, is there a story that you always think back to and say, this is my favorite story or this is the thing that always comes to mind? Well, there's there are a, a number of them hmm. uh, that come to mind, like... Uh, like a like a segue a, a badly blown segue and whenever i hear evil woman by elo i think back to how how i at the board thought that i could successfully skip the intro with the uh with the vocals and the piano and go right into the song uh without thinking that i was going to wow in the mm -hmm. song brutally from the turntable <laughs> and uh every time i hear that song i, re I remember that and I, I chuckle wow it haunts it haunts me <laughs> not in a bad way do you this, this might be asking too much detail do you remember what you were trying to seg out of and then go into evil woman actually actually i don't mm. uh actually i don't and then and there was another another time when we we were in the studio. It was uh, Lynn Robinson's show, ten to midnight, like a Thursday night, and uh, and we had been over to Bill's Meadowbrook before the show for a couple of beers, and and during the show she played Brown Sugar, and you have to have this. There were turntables, and uh, there were two turntables and two turntable pots, and the switches on the turntable pots were such that. Uh, you could actually override the right turntable with a switch being thrown on the the pot for the left turntable that was possible to happen hmm. and uh, never happened, except it happened when <laughs> we had these speakers were suspended from the ceiling and the dust covers for the turntables, uh, they had dust covers you put them on at the end of the night to keep the dust off the felt and they were huge mm -hmm. huge records huge and uh we had the speakers blasting in the studio so loud that we didn't realize this was happening but the uh those records came off and it came down came down on me they were light and somehow we were not on the air anymore and nobody we i couldn't figure out what happened until i looked over you know, after like the excruciating, like five seconds of dead air, uh, and realized that the selector switch to kill the right turntable had, had happened. And then we, I just un, undid it, but it was like, how often could that happen? But I always remember when I hear brown sugar, <laughs> what happened? Wow. So, so it was, it was, I guess technically it was just too loud in the studio and those, those, those turntable protectors came down and just, hit the board or something is that is that right they, they hit me hit, hit me hit the board and you know, they vibrated we, we played this the uh the, the audio was so loud the speakers were cranked up so far that they vibrated themselves off the top of those speakers <laughs> and down on <laughs> rain down rain down on me <laughs> wow you crazy kids in your rock and roll music it's too loud wow what a story that is, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure all of us are guilty at some point or another of, of cranking up a song as loud as it can possibly go, but I, I've not heard something like that. That's, and that, like you said, that sticks with you. That, that's, so, so that's two songs that, I don't know if, the, I don't want to say they're ruined for you, but they are, they're with you forever. 
those those experiences my goodness they, wow they definitely a reminder and and uh you know back with the, that was the technology then you know the turntable and blah 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 now you're just punching up a, a you know a wave file or a mp3 file but but there was another time when we did a remote from mm. uh from Bill's Meadowbrook, which was the watering hole on the corner of Meadowbrook Place over by the uh, the football stadium. And uh, we're down in the basement. It was a big deal. It was a Friday night. We're doing a remote. We're having music, DJ. And, and I had the place cranked up over there. And then we were joining from the, the studio was joining us. And I neglected to turn down the speakers at Bill's Meadowbrook when we went on the air. And all of a sudden, feedback was unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable feedback. It's like, oh, man. But it was at Bill's Meadowbrook, so there may have been some, some, some Pepsis beforehand. But right. uh, that, that lives with me when uh, Squeeze Box by The Who... <laughs> when you rarely hear that one. So, you know, for, for those, for those live remotes for doing like something at Bill's Meadowbrook, were you getting a lot of students for that? Was it people from the community? Was it, was it people from the station who was coming to those events and, and what kind of feedback did you guys get? It was a heavily a listeners that would come to something like that. Hmm. The listeners. And, and, and I'm sure it's a Friday night. I'm sure there were dorm students there. You know, we didn't, yeah, I, I specifically don't don't recall who they were, but I mean, there were good. It was a good hundred people down there. Hmm. That sounds like a good time. Sounds like a lot of fun. They had they had a lot of fun once we got everything straightened out. <laughs> I bet. Um, so those are some stories that that always stick with you about your time working at the station. Are there stories that, that uh, you've forgotten about or don't get a chance to tell very often that you wouldn't mind sharing? One thing I had forgotten about was, uh, you know, how the, a lot of thing about election tallying hmm. and uh, how important it is. Well, there was a time when we were doing a remote from like the Hempstead Board of Elections for the, the mayoral uh, mayor of Hempstead and uh, some other offices that were being elected. And we, WVHC, with a small adding machine, mm. actually tallied the election live on the air. They were writing the results from the different precincts on a blackboard. And, and I was an accountant, or I'm still an accountant, but yeah. you know, you can never not be an accountant. Uh, was was tallying the uh, election, and we actually we actually were the official electorate, and we called the election, and uh, it was it was pretty funny because it was not a real exciting uh, uh, place, uh, kind of dark and dreary, and uh, but we live on the air, you know, did the tally for the election, which I thought was incredible. I forgot all about that. You think of what goes into tallying, tallying an election. Now <laughs> we're doing right. it with a, you know, stone knives and bearskins, as Mister Spock <laughs> called it on Star Trek. <laughs> the technology was so different. I mean, I when I have my high school students now, and I try to explain what an adding machine is or, or, you know, a calculator that, that would spit out those little spools of tape. I assume it's, you know, you got the little keypad there and you're seeing the numbers uh, come in and put on the, the board, but you weren't at an elections uh, precinct. You weren't where the actual voting machines were. People were calling the numbers in. Is that right? That's right. The different precincts were calling them in. They were writing them on the board. I mean, they weren't doing this for, for us. Right. They were doing it. For the, for the for the election headquarters, and I was just, hey, there's numbers there. What do you do with numbers when you're accounting? You add them up. Wow. So, so we were able to add them, and then they, they, you know, they were checked, and WVHC was there, and we wow. got some food out of it too. Well, that's 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 always a a nice bonus for things there. Do you remember anybody who you were working with on that election night? Any of the the students or any of the the producers who were uh, working that night? 
Well, I know Jerry, I know Jerry Landau was there. He was, he was sports director, but he, he was uh, the kind of guy that would get involved in, in that kind of a serious uh, uh, remote. I remember Jerry would have been there and, uh, and Todd Schwartz, who was the, the younger brother of Marvin Schwartz, who was, a, who was the sports director before him, who preceded him. Hmm. And then Todd was, Todd was also involved with the sports announcing. Hmm. Um, thank you for sharing those names. That's, that's, that's great to hear. And it's interesting that um, I, I didn't, would never have thought of this before I got involved in radio and, and, and then TV later on that oftentimes the sports guys who are very often focused on their sport or doing play by play or whatever it is that they're interested in doing, they have to by necessity pick up the remote broadcasting skills. They have to be able to think on their feet. They have to be able to, uh, you know, succinctly report what's going on and it lends itself so well uh, to breaking news and, and election night kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of fun that, that um, we often think of, well, who's the news director or who's the lead anchor, but oftentimes it's sports guys who are, who are out there in the field doing these things. And I guess uh, you guys must've known how to work together. Oh yeah. We were all, we, we all worked together and mm -hmm. we had, and we all had a lot of laughs and played jokes on each other and all kinds of other junk. We mentioned, you mentioned that we mentioned the sport guys, I mean, the sports guys were able to come up with these big innovations like uh, we worked out when uh, there was trouble with the cues going back and forth when uh, they were doing a football game mm -hmm. or a basketball game. There were, there were cues. We were supposed to use a talk back line through the board. It, it was never as reliable as it should have been. So we just came up with a simple idea of, of the, the guys in the booth over there at the stadium or in the Calkins gym at the time. Uh, had an FM radio and they would be listening to air. Okay. Mm. They could be listening to air and they would cue it back to us by saying, you know, you're listening to flying Dutchman football on WVHC. And we would know to take it back, do a break. And then when we were kicking it back to them, we would use the same cue back to the, back to Calkins gymnasium, back to the stadium for, for uh, the football game and then they would know to take it so there was no question about when you were getting cued and it was mm. so simple all you had to have was a little fm radio mm. that's smart and i guess there wouldn't have been any kind of delay or, or lag because it was all happening at the same time right right it was all it was all real time it was all within you know hundreds of yards mm. and, and and the landau guys landau and, and schwartz and we came up with an idea. We, we had instant replays of, of audio. And the wow. way we did that is we had to, the two Ampex machines, the two tape machines, two reel-to-reel -reel machines, were recording the event at the same time. And we used one of those machines to, to uh, do an instant replay. It took a, little, a couple, couple of seconds to do it, and it was a little hairy because you were working alone in the back in the, in the control room, hmm. but you could actually get a, an instant replay, you know, if you kept your wits about you and, and queued it up, you know, cause you didn't have to do anything with the announcers, you know, during the remote, you just had them on the board, uh, going on the air. So you'd queue up the instant replay and then you'd play it for them. So we were like, we were avant, avant guard. <laughs> wow. That's, that sounds so interesting. So, so the idea was to play back, let's say, a, a call for a goal or a touchdown or something like that to play it back right away. Was that was that? Yeah, the to plan? play it back as as soon as you could. Wow. So you're so if you're in the studio and you're running the live feed and you've got the two reel to reel machines running, you've got to keep an eye on like when you know the the, the time stamp or, or the the counter number to know how far to go back. I assume, and then and then you quick rewind and pot it up and play it. Is that is that right? Well, there was I don't I don't remember being close enough to look at the counter on the thing. I mean, yeah. you just basically pulled it out of your butt. <laughs> <laughs> And cute and cute it up. I mean, there was no pressure to have it be immediate, right? Okay, but but say there was a flag or something, you know. So you had you had time to do it, but you just had to stay cool. Mm. You know, you couldn't panic. How am I going to do? It? You could just you're just going you're going to do it. You're going to do it. and It's going to work. 
and and we used one machine for to you know the scrap machine to do the do the instant replays the other the other one was just straight use for playing the game but I mean, those were big things on TV. They're doing instant replays back then, and it wasn't as simple as it is now. Right. Yeah. I mean, the technology's changed so much. But the, the, I hate to call it the limitations of the time, but the reality of the time, I guess, made you come up with really innovative ways to try things and to be creative and to say, okay, we're going to do this. And, uh, again, you're doing it by feel, basically, it sounds like. You're paying attention to the game. you got an idea how long ago that was. And then your experience and you know, understanding, being able to listen and to understand the game, you figure out how to make that work. And that's, uh, I don't know, was there, was there trial and error with doing these things? Or was it just, we think this will work, let's try it? It was more, we think, it, it, trial and error on the air. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> Is this going to work? But we were, we were surrounded by inspirational and creative people. You know, we had George Berger and we had Teddy Ronneberger. Hmm. Okay, we had Sue Charnas, we had Ross Mitchell. We had people who, who, who you know, just inspired thinking out out of the box. This is before the box was even built. We were thinking out of the box. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's it's interesting too that the the names that you mention aren't necessarily the 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 on air names or public air names that people would know. You're talking about a lot of behind the scenes people, a lot of people who are working behind the board and aren't necessarily putting their voices on the air. In your mind, those are the creative people. I love that take on it. Yes, they were very very creative. Yep. And and you know, like you say, well, we've got this idea for something how do we make it work? And somehow you, you make things work. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure not every experiment works out, but to be able to innovate in that way, it's just, uh, it's, that's so interesting. Um, and again, the general public listening wouldn't necessarily know these names or know who's making the things happen or pushing the buttons. But in your mind, in our minds, we know those are the people who are, who are making things work. I, I love that, that take. Thank you for sharing that. That's cool. You know, guys like George George Berger worked at WABC, and he came up with a concept. He wanted to take one one of their jingles, and he wanted to rearrange it. Mm-hmm. So live on the air, he figured out with the six cart machines that they had, he queued different carts up to different places, and then he made a collage jingle uh, in one shot on the air on WABC using all the six card machines and still keeping, keeping the, the air sound going and everything else, no mistakes or anything. We'll, we'll, if you hear somebody doing like that and we knew it was true, hmm. we'd say, gosh, you know, now you could do that with a, with an editing machine. Right. Right. You know, you wouldn't need you. He didn't even splice things together. He just queued this one up to this point and, and, and went forward, you know, you got guys that are doing that kind of stuff, you know, you, you start to think creatively. <laughs> right. Right. You, you're inspired by other people or there's a, a friendly competition. Well, that was cool. I want to do something cool. So then then you push your own limits. How how interesting. And and as you're describing working those with cart machines, I'm thinking of like a, a, a DJ with a mixing board and turntables at a live party and they're mixing in different records and they're. Uh, going from from track to track and mixing those things. How wow, that's really impressive. Wow, very cool. Um, are there other things that 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 come to mind about other innovative ways that you pushed the technology or or worked uh, as a team to do things that you know previously you weren't able to do? It was it was all it was all as a team. Mm. It was uh, yeah, it was. Not a lot of ind- individual efforts, you know, the things that I described to you, I mean, they were, everybody was involved in it that I, that I named. Yeah. Uh, it was just, they, they were there, but we just didn't know they were there until we figured out they were there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, a couple of minutes ago, you were, you were talking about uh, all the guys 
making each other laugh and and having fun with things. Are there are there funny stories that you remember? Are there things that always make you laugh when when you think back to them uh, about your time at at the station? Well, you could take sure there. You could take uh, Tommy Curley, um, very creative guy. When he mm-hmm. was brand new, you always tortured the new people, <laughs> and he was it. He was an announcer. Uh, he started as an announcer when he was a freshman and wanted to have a really great career in, in radio at CBS FM and CBS TV and the audio side. Uh, he, he, we, we figured out when he was reading the news or the weather or anything, we would just feed garbage into his earphones instead of air. And uh, we had one, one cart that had, uh, and this wouldn't go on the air. This would only go go in the earphones of the poor right. guy trying to read read something. And uh, we had one cart that went, G-hey-hey, pooey. Mm-hmm. And we, we would just incessantly do that, do that to Tommy to try to crack him up. And, and uh, even now when he, we communicate, you know, sometimes we, you know, like we'll get a Facebook messenger and he'll say, G-hey-hey, how are you doing, Dunn? <laughs> <laughs> So, so no hard feelings. It's all in good fun, right? Right. It, it, actually, actually, it was good for you. Okay. How do you not crack up? How, you know, I've seen people that that the the copy was lit on fire while they were reading it, oh and uh, they just read faster. You know, you just <laughs> you got to got to read a lot faster. I, you know, there were a lot of torturous things that were done to people. Uh, even poor Fred Motley, the the. Uh, Football. He was a football announcer. He was. He had a jazz show two nights mm-hmm. a week. He was. Uh, he he was a bus driver for the Beeline Bus Company, so he definitely didn't go to Hofstra. Right. But he was a gr- great announcer and he was good with jazz. And one night we decided to play a game with him because he would listen to his FM radio on 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 the cans. He he didn't listen to uh, air. He listened to air his way, so we decided to put him in delay, and uh, we really screwed him up. We, we we put him in delay, and he started hitting his hitting his radio with his fist until he took off his headphones and went back to normal normal space. Hmm. So it, there were all kinds of little little pranks that we could play uh, on people, whether they liked it or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think, you know, just in being in the business and being part of a, a family and community, there, there's always opportunities and, and uh, a desire to, to, to have fun that way. And it's, uh, like I said, it's there's there's no hard feelings. You're not trying to mess up someone's broadcast. You're just having some fun. And hopefully everybody takes it that way. And sometimes um, we were in separate rooms, right? So you could see through the glass and sometimes two, two guys would... Uh, would distract an announcer by by putting their hands down their down their pants through their flies and shaking hands uh which uh would really crack some of the people up but then it, it got old and uh, it didn't work anymore right right it's but just... you had to be tough because you know yeah the pranks are being pulled on you but but there are going to be times when things are going to go wrong and yeah. you got to be not rattled by it. You got to be thinking, George Berger, don't panic. Yeah. Don't panic. Yeah, that's that, that's good advice. Sometimes it's a little harder to do than 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 to say, but uh you know, in our last conversation you you said several times like we and you said earlier, we wanted to do things right. We wanted to do them well. And and there's this level of professionalism, I think that even you know, jokes aside and, and teasing aside, there's a there's a level of excellence that's expected at the station. And uh, I'm wondering, in, in your opinion, does that come from the individuals who are at the station? Does that come from Jeff Krauss? Does that come from the community? Where, where is that? Because I'm sure there are plenty of people who sort of looked at it as, you know, this is a goof off, this isn't serious. But for you and so many others, there was that standard. Um, is that an individual thing? Is that a station thing? Where does that come from? I mean, it basically was implied. Mm. I mean, you, it, it, WVHC wasn't the only radio station you ever heard in your lifetime. And, uh, 
and you knew what was going on there and you you knew that you knew uh you just assumed that that was what is expected of you and if and if you didn't have that standard you weren't going to be around too long there mm. you weren't going to be working on the air because the you know the object of the game is to solve the puzzle uh mm. you know do it uh, do it right that was everybody's goal and uh and i heard one one of the persons that you interviewed uh, last year uh mentioned that he didn't feel bad if he screwed up because it was only 320 watts and wasn't going that far and i really disagree with uh mm. with that person's values <laughs> <laughs> do it do it do it right or don't do it and that and that was like you know everything i ever was involved in in, in my career uh, which was in accounting and finance was you got to do it right yeah well the person that gets your job is going to do it right mm. Mm. um you've shared so many stories and 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 momentous occasions during your time at hofstra radio is there one thing that stands out as a proudest moment or biggest accomplishment? I don't think there's anything that stands out as the biggest, uh, you know, being involved with people mm -hmm. who, uh, who innovated, you know, the, the, the things with the remotes and the, and the, uh, the uh, instant replays and the simple things with, uh, with an FM radio to, to help everybody be in sync. Right. Uh, I mean, those things were, we're, we were proud. We were proud of of those things. There was no single single thing that I did over there. I don't think. I don't consider I did anything anything except, except do my job. That's the mm. thing I look back at. Do my job. Well, it, if I if I could say, all the years that you spent at the radio station, to me, that's a tremendous accomplishment. That you kept coming back, whether it's once a week or twice a week or however often you kept coming back and there were so many different people you worked with, I'm sure. And over time from, you know, I think you started 1967. Is that right? Yeah, and then over the next 10, 11 years, that's a big change in the culture. And I'm sure, you know, who, who was coming to the radio station that, that in and of itself, that longevity and that persistence and that professionalism to me, if you don't mind my saying, that's a huge accomplishment. That's something to really be proud of. Well, well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, some of the some of the kids, some of the kids, some of the students. It was it was kind of funny one night. I was there and I was uh, engineering for a classical music or mm -hmm. something yeah. where I wasn't totally interested in what the guy was playing, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was reading Newsday. Uh, and uh, doing the segues, and one of the newer people said, "Boy, isn't that amazing? He looks like he's not paying attention at all." And then he does the segue. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what you do. Yeah, you get good at it, and uh, it becomes uh, second nature. And and the things that people, you know, looking from the outside in, they don't understand that you may be reading the newspaper or reading the sports scores, but you're mind is concentrating on on the sound and you've got an eye on the levels and you're watching the record turn that that once you get used to it and you get that practice you get really good at it and it becomes a part of who you are um and and again given the amount of time and all the things that you did i think uh hofstra radio definitely became uh an important part uh of your life and and who you are if, if that's fair to say oh oh absolutely I, I loved it. You're, you're always, a lot of us always have our ears open to a record that is ending. Mm -hmm. always, mm -hmm. Something has got to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I still, still think that way now. Uh, something's got to happen. But yeah. with Auto Segue, I don't think you have to worry about that anymore. No. No, but I always think that whether we're, we're playing something at home on the record player or I hear something on the radio or wherever it might be, in my head, I'm always thinking, where are you going next? Are you playing a station ID? Are you playing another record? Are you go it's, it's, you know, it's 
deep in the background. It's not you know necessarily conscious thought, but I'm always thinking about that. What what comes next? What would I play next? What would be a good segue? Um, you know, how do you transition out of this? It's always part of it. So um, yeah, I guess I guess uh, you know that's that's why we do this, right? That's why we got into radio, and that's why we still love it today, even all these years later. It's it's ingrained. Even when I when I'm at karaoke, sometimes when I a song when I'm going to sing a song or something, I I will actually be talk up the song by doing the W A B C New York I D because ah. <laughs> <laughs> that great. was that was that was Oz that was Oz hmm. always always do an ID or talk up the talk up the record even at karaoke it's really funny <laughs> oh that's fun that's good stuff um what do you miss most about your time at Hofstra Radio. I miss running the board. I miss interacting with other people uh, and getting the job done there. Hmm. Uh, I really, uh, you know, I work, I went to a local radio station here a couple of years ago looking to get some part-time work, uh, but they, they don't need any part-timers and nobody, everybody combos, so you don't need anybody to run the board, but I actually did learn how to, uh, how to run the board and how to run with computers versus turntables and mm. mouse, mouse devices and keyboards versus mm-hmm. your hands. Uh, so I really did, I really do miss that, that, that teamwork of getting something done right. And I even, I even these folks, the, the local station, you know, they're, they're actually doing their ID wrong and they won't listen <laughs> they won't listen and I, and I and 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 I hope that they eventually do listen because it drives me crazy uh you know you you do that what's on your license is your id yeah you know wxxx quincy if you're a license says weymouth you're not supposed to say you're in quincy okay so but I do miss being involved, but there's there's very little I can do about getting involved other than buying my own radio station. Right, but that's what right. I miss is, is being 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 involved with the team to to get the thing done right yeah. and have fun while you're doing it. Have lots of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I can I can tell that even even all these years later, it was uh, it was so much fun. So let's say hypothetically, let's say you get a call from John Mullen, or you happen to be driving through Hempstead and you stop by the station and they say, Hey, we need someone to do a show or we need someone to run the board or to run this game. Would you be willing to do it? Yeah. Again, can you give me the address? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll go in. I'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, we'll figure it out and uh, give us a couple of minutes. If it's a, if it's a board assignment, give me a couple of hiccups, and uh, and I'll be all set. I'll be all set. Uh, yeah, I would definitely do it because it's you know. And if it's announcer wise, uh, you know, Malcolm Malcolm Soul uh, used to work at Hofstra, and he was discovered at at a place called Models down the road in East uh-huh. Meadow. Uh-huh. He was the store announcer. Malcolm Soul, Malcolm Davis, Austin of Boston. He had different names but he had a very successful professional radio uh career and he really was 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 very inspirational to us we we discovered him on a on a friday night somebody discovered him and brought him in and uh he he read the he read the he read the weather and, and everybody looked at themselves and go this guy's gonna be this guy's gonna be working here mm. and he but he, one thing he taught us later on in life, I, I got to interview him for actually the, a newspaper that the uh, radio station used to put out like 20 years ago uh, that Marilyn used to uh, edit. And he was like, it's you and the mic. Sometimes, you know, everything else is going to fail. Turntables, you know, it's you and the mic and you got to make it work. Mm. Wow. Wow, oh, that's cool. So, so tell me where I'm needed and I'll be down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 these are hypotheticals. And I'm sure when John Mullen or, or Kathleen or somebody at the station hears these, they'll be shaking their fist at me because they're going to have a, a, a line of, of 
folks ready to go on the air for them. But if you, you know, if you could choose, would you want to do a, a music program? Would you want to do a sports game? Like, you know, hypothetically, magically, you know, whatever it might be, whatever circumstances, what would you think you have the most fun doing at the station? If you were to do oh, it, definitely, it definitely would be, be a music show. Hmm. And, uh, and, and if there were no limits, it would be anything from, anything from uh, the Beatles to uh, Doja Cat. Uh, and I would figure out a way to make it, make it work. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, you must have had a lot of fun. You worked with a lot of different announcers and show producers over time. Uh, do, you, do you remember some of the names of people? I, I, I mean, you've mentioned so many. But uh, given the amount of time that you were there and what it meant to you, I wanted to make sure that if there were any names you wanted to include or shows, uh, who are some of the people that you really loved uh, working with at the station? Uh, D- Dick Harkoff, uh, Chris Zuboff. Let's see. Shelly Foyer. She was, she was the best. Mm. She was, she was one of the best, uh, really nice lady night song. Mm-hmm. Gary Armstrong, I get to run the board for Gary Armstrong. Um, Let's see. And then there was Lynn Robinson and, uh, and Linda Daleter and, uh, Jay Arnold, Jay Arnold, Jay Arnold Weinreb. He, he, he was there. He was a really good announcer. Uh, Alan Combs, mm-hmm. you know, from, he had his own talk shows. He became very famous. He's, he's not around anymore. He's, he's deceased, but he, you know, just think I'm a senior at, at, at uh, St. John's and, Alan Combs is uh, a junior at uh, Lindbrook High School, yeah. or Malvern High School, uh, but he was fun to work with. Uh, there were so many different people that I got to work that I got to work the board, work the board for. It was even jazz shows. Sweet Olson, I got to work the board for Sweet for sometimes, mm-hmm. and Fred Motley. I mean, it, the and the hits just kept on coming. Yeah. That's a lot of great names. That's uh, that's those are some historic names and a few that are new to me. So, um, thank you for sharing those. Yeah, it's I think it's really important to remember uh, as many folks as we can as we talk about these things. But I, I'd like to to time travel with you for a second. We're we're gonna have sixty seconds. You can go back and talk to yourself when you were 21, first showing up at the radio station, first showing up at Hofstra, just hoping to get involved somehow. If you could give that younger version of yourself some advice, what would it be? This is the sixty seconds. Yeah, yeah, you got, you got to go. <laughs> I got this, the thing in my ear, and the announcers yell, the uh, guy in the control booth yell, "You got sixty seconds. That's it. Hard break." <laughs> the, the, I would have told that guy going down the station to to uh, to push a little harder. And to believe in himself a bit more and see that there was, you know, something there on the announcing side uh, to pursue because Steve Rosenfeld, Bob Dunn, very successful person came out of that station, told me like on the second day that that I had a good voice and that I should be an announcer Mm. and I didn't pursue it. I I, I would have pursued that because I wasn't that heavy, heavy into my career uh, as an accountant yet where I couldn't have, you know, taken another turn. So that, that's what advice I would have been given myself is to, is to push harder, uh, to get more involved in this rather than, rather than just enjoy it, you know, pursue it as a career. Mm. Have more confidence and put in the work. Yeah. That's sounds like good advice. Um, now, you, you didn't pursue radio as, as your main career. Like you said, you, you became an accountant and, and you did that for many years. But I think you worked at other stations after you moved to Connecticut. So I guess my, my roundabout sort of question here is, what were the lessons or the skills or, or the ideas that you took from Hofstra Radio uh, into your grown-up and professional life? Well, when I, when I moved to Connecticut... Uh... I met some people who told me that the, the fellow was working Saturday nights at, at the local radio station. And, and, uh, he said they were looking for somebody to do the afternoons on, on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, it was, it wasn't all announcing. It was a lot of 
babysitting mm. for people and their tapes. And uh, but he got me, but he got me in there. And the thing, the skill that I had of of uh, being able to be, you know, dead nuts on the board enabled me to come in and get an announcing job, a combo announcing job, uh, at that station without any experience in combo announcing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know, so it took me about a half an hour to to get to get the whole thing together, but. Uh, it was the weekends and, and the basic, basic thing was somebody is filling the slot on the weekend. And so the program director doesn't have to show up and do the job himself. Right. So, it, but that was what I learned, you know, all the skills I learned on how to run a board, uh, how to think, how to not panic, uh, how to make things work, uh, how to deal with adversity, uh, those things, uh, those things I learned from Hofstra and how to, you know, I didn't learn from Hofstra, but one night, one night, the, uh, the burglar alarm got tripped, the silent alarm got tripped at the station and there was no reason for it because nobody had broken in. But, uh, but I was reading, a, I was standing up reading and reading a spot or something. Uh, Cause we stood up at that place and uh, the cops came in with guns drawn <laughs> And I'm reading the spot and I finished reading the spot and went to the record before I dealt with them. <laughs> but, <laughs> wow. Wow. See, that's, a, that's all the training there. That's, you know, people lighting copy on fire and throwing things at each other and making rude gestures. It trains you for when there's an actual emergency and, and the police come in, you know, with guns drawn, you're, you're not phased because you've, you've seen a few things and that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. That's cool. And my hands were up because I was holding the copy. <laughs> <laughs> always being respectful, always being professional, do it right. Uh, yeah, that's, wow. Oh, boy, that's what an experience. Were you aware that the alarm was going off or were you just you just busy working and doing your thing? No, I think it was a, it was a, I think it was a silent alarm. I don't remember the there being any noise involved. No flashing lights or anything. It just, the cops show up and... I'm just the DJ. Don't shoot, right? <laughs> I'm just the DJ, and it's and it's the nighttime on the weekend, and there's nobody else here. You know, news had gone home. You know, right? That was it. So, but <laughs> but you got to meet some of the, you know, the Stanford police. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was a, a interesting interaction. Uh, I'm sure they they were relieved there was nothing going on. It was just uh, just you in there. But, yeah, it was it was just me and, wow. and Mrs. Terenzio listening, uh, you know, on the other end because that was like at the nighttime. You know, the station was only like a couple of hundred watts at the, at the nighttime. Mm. So, the birds that were near the transmitter were probably the only listeners at that yeah. time. You just you don't know you don't know, and that's why you always do it right and you follow through and and you do because you don't know who's listening and 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 that's the nice thing. There might be people who who count on, on your professionalism and, and getting things out. They'll never call. They'll never show up in the ratings, but, but they're out there listening. And that's, uh, that's a cool thing. Um, I want to double back for a second. Again, given, given the length of time um, you were at the station, is there anything that stands out in your mind as, as, as a big change in the way that things were done or was a consistency? What, you know, is there an overall arc or, or idea or change to your time at the station? You know, I didn't notice a, a lot of uh, change in philosophy or anything else. Uh, they did, uh, the station did get the uh, uh, the offices over at Memorial Hall. I think mm -hmm. I never, I think I never got to go there. And there were different administrations of, of people that, uh, you know, different station managers and different all, all different slots because, you know, they were there for four years and that, and then they weren't. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a whole new crew, you know, coming in, coming in uh, each year almost. And, uh, you know, but still it was, Jeff was, Jeff was the guy mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he, he set the tone for uh, the station. He, Jeff set the tone and, uh, you know, I saw maybe some jazz shows happen, this sweet Olsen thing, uh, but basically we were the 12, we were the, from six to 12, you know, maybe it became a little bit more, 
when uh, when the Hempstead Public Schools were, right. were broadcasting there. But uh, I didn't see a lot of huge change, just different people doing the same thing right. Hmm. Yeah, I just I, I was just thinking back to our earlier conversation that, you know, you start when you started, it was a time of I don't want to use the word crisis, but, you know, so, some amount of trepidation about the future of the radio station and then to be able to stick with it as it you know gains its footing and grows and the different generations come through it must have been just just a wonderful experience for you and i mean it must be we're still talking about it to this day but um i just i just love to to, to hear stories and from your unique perspective that you got to see all this happen it uh um it's uh it's great to hear your stories and we inherited every once in a while we would inherit a piece of equipment from from WMCA or WABC that mm. they, they no longer needed. And like when I started, there was, there was a little thing called the level devil. That was your compressor. Uh-huh. Uh, and it wasn't very fast. So if you didn't pay attention to your VU meter and you started going into the red, you could recycle the transmitter, which meant you went off the air, the transmitter went off, then it went back on by itself. You know, and you'd get yelled at if Teddy or or Jeff heard it, uh, but that's all you had was was the level devil. Then we actually got some things, some compressors, a volume max and automax from uh, from the New York radio stations when they didn't need it anymore. Uh, and so the, the the evolution in some of the equipment, the third cart machine. You know, mm. we only had two, now we have three. Uh, the remote control for the cart machine, <laughs> right. It's a big step up, right? Um, <laughs> big, big steps up, but we were still a 320 watt effective radiated power uh, radio station, and uh, the controls in the in the, the board was the same the whole time that I was there. Uh, I think production changed a little bit. I think they got some better equipment, but uh, you know, th- those were the things that happened. Mm. Well, Frank, this has been um, tremendous. I'm I'm so honored that you would take take the time to come back and and talk with me and and share your stories. These are these are phenomenal. And uh, again, I'm I'm so appreciative uh, of you taking the time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and thank you all, Hofstra's. <laughs>